This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up, Wisecrack? Michael here with another juicy book versus film, where we dive into how a story changes as it jumps from typewriter to celluloid. And this time, we're going wild. No, not that long distance hiking based epic. I'm talking about Lord of the Rings, the multi-part exploration of a young boy's hiking journey in the middle part of the earth. Now, considering the sheer scope of the book, it's only natural that things had to change to bring it to the screen. So that's what we're looking at today. And we'll state up front, we're only talking the narrative text of Lord of the Rings here. No Silmarillion, no unfinished tales. We're not even using the appendices. We need some strict rules here, gang, because frankly, if everything Tolkien wrote about Middle-earth was fair game, then by the end of this video, I would have a Gandalf beard. So Three, without further two, ado, welcome one. to this episode of Book vs. Film, Lord of the Rings. Now, before we jump into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. Recently, I've been seeing a lot of bald hate on my timeline, and I wanted to take a second to say there are a lot of great looking bald guys out there. It can be a good look, but just like any other haircut style, it should be your choice. Luckily, there are ways to prevent hair loss. Keeps is an affordable hair loss prevention subscription service that offers FDA approved prescription and over-the-counter medication that can be shipped right to your door. You can meet with a Keeps doctor online and have the medication shipped right to you. It can take four to six months to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start, the more hair you can save. With Keeps, some men even see hair regrowth, so don't lose your luscious locks. For a limited time, go to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order. That's keeps.com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. First off, the similarities. Let's move swiftly through the similarities. Both share the same core narrative. A group of heroes, a fellowship if you will, set out on an epic quest to destroy the One Ring, an object of great and evil power in order to save the world. All of the major beats are hit in both, to the point where someone who's only seen the films and someone who's only read the book could pretty much talk about the story on equal footing. But don't leave yet because there are crucial differences and they all lie in the details. These changes have a fundamental impact on the way we perceive both the characters and Middle Earth as a whole. Which brings us to the differences. Now, for a work that Stanley Kubrick, of all people, considered unfilmable, director Peter Jackson managed to adapt an incredible amount of the book. Jackson, Philippa Boyens, and Fran Walsh used every trick in the screenwriting manual to realize Middle Earth on film, and naturally, a big part of that was a keen eye for what to include and what to omit. Some characters, like the fabled Tom Bombadil, Middle Earth's patron saint of plot tangents, were pretty much never going to make it to the screen. Other things, like the book's use of nonlinear timelines and stories within stories, would get pretty tricky on screen, even if you're Christopher Nolan. So they were altered in the adaptation. But with a work as dense as The Lord of the Rings, those necessary creative decisions can have some unintended effects. Difference number one, the end of the world. Let's start here. In the films, Middle Earth is right on the precipice of change, but with the promise of a return to normalcy helmed by humankind. But in the book, there's no such optimism. It's pretty clear everyone is living in a civilization in decline. This happens mostly through omission, since the movies couldn't have fit in every piece of Middle Earth lore. But it drastically changes the tone of the films. The TLDR is that in the books, Middle Earth has actually been through two events that we could consider apocalyptic, each much more dire than the War of the Ring that we do see. These calamities saw godlike beings, infinitely more powerful than the likes of Gandalf and Sauron, waging all out war. Entire swaths of Middle Earth were lost in the destruction. People like the Numenorians, Aragorn's ancestors, were either corrupted by Sauron or wiped out for the sins of the rest. A lot of the exact details of these are found in other books like The Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales, but Tolkien still conveys the history of Middle Earth and its lost grandeur in the actual trilogy through the songs, verses, and poems recited by the characters. To highlight why this omission matters, let's look at the film first. Early in the quest, the Fellowship ends up having to take a detour through the Mines of Moria, an abandoned ancestral home of the dwarves. The film, tasked with portraying the lost majesty of Moria, or cause of doom if you're nasty, leans into its strengths. There's an eye opener and no mistake. Through the lens of the camera, we see the massive scope of the dwarves' old home as the Fellowship enters the Dwerodelf. In the book, the Fellowship still ventures into Moria, but instead of being awed by the accomplishment of the old dwarves, Sam actually dunks on the place, calling them darksome holes. Gimli responds by reciting the Song of Durin, 
which tells Moria's history before the fall. The world was fair, the mountains tall, in elder days before the fall, of mighty kings in Nargothrond and Gondolin, who now beyond the western seas have passed away. The world was fair in Doran's day. It mentions the mighty kings of Nargothrond and Gondolin. Wait, where? Well, it doesn't really matter. Even without any deets, the passage still conveys a sense of long lost wonder and achievement. This passage and the rest of the song detail not only Moria's lost glory, but that of the rest of Middle-earth as well, telling us the world was fair before the fall. And the books do this throughout, using myths and legends to allude to Middle-earth's glory days. Another key song, obviously missing from the films, comes from Bilbo, right before the meme deposit that is the Council of Elrond. It's about a half-elven sailor of old, who built a ship to sail to heaven to ask for help in a fight against Sauron's super swole cousin. He saw the mountain silent rise, where twilight lies upon the knees of Valinor and Eldamar, beheld afar beyond the seas. A wanderer escaped from night, to Haven White he came at last, to Elvenholm, the green and fair, where keen the air, where pale as glass, beneath the hill of Ilmarin, a glimmer in a valley sheer, the lamplit towers of Tyrion are mirrored on the shadow mirror. The poem details all of the ethereal and celestial sights he sees along his journey, and gives us key insight into the sources of ancient power that the Fellowship often draws upon. More importantly, it ties this power to the Elder Days, something that the Song of Durin clearly states can't be achieved again in this broke-ass Middle-earth. So cool magic stuff that seems a little convenient in the film, like Sam's magic flashlight, are actually firmly rooted in the book's lore. Overall, these two songs evoke a rich history of the bygone times of grandeur that cement the tone of the books. For all the epicness of the struggle against Sauron, all the magic and heroism, the books are actually pretty wistful. Through all the lore of the songs, verses, and poems, you get a clearer impression of just how far the elves have fallen and how dope Middle-earth used to be. Minas Tirith in the films is a symbol of Gondor's might, whereas in the book it's a testament to their more capable, more divine forebearers. It's like if you lived in a house that your grandparents built with their bare hands, but your lazy ass can barely reattach a doorknob. Tolkien was a devout Catholic and grew up watching the pastoral English countryside steadily replaced with crude products of industrialism. These songs speak to his perspective, that England had decayed both spiritually and materially, and his longing for an idyllic past, whether or not that actually existed. Despite the legendary scope of the book, it's surprisingly personal, insofar as Tolkien's experiences arguably informed most of the core of the story and the world. Which leads us to difference number two, the characters. In the movies, like nearly all good movies, the characters grow and change. We to join the Tower Guard. I didn't think they would find any livery that would fit me. In the book, however, characters are by and large static archetypes. That's not a diss on Tolkien, because for him, that was kind of the point. Tolkien was more of a world builder than a novelist, and was famously known for creating the languages of Middle-earth before Middle-earth itself, a move that presumably made him a real hit at the pub. Speaking to his American publisher, Tolkien said, The invention of languages is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the languages than the reverse. To me, a name comes first and the story follows. When adding story to the world, he looked to his favorite fairy tales, myths, and legends for inspiration. And the thing is, by their nature, neither fairy tale nor myth is overly concerned with now conventional storytelling devices like character arcs or narrative structure. For example, we don't need a big character arc from Sisyphus to know it's a story about endless futility. Which isn't to say some mythic figures don't get put into longer narratives with character arcs. But broadly speaking, mythic characters are symbolic, meant to represent abstract concepts rather than depict humanity in all its complexity. As a result, in the books, we get Frodo representing humble selflessness, Aragorn representing the ideal of a true king, and Gandalf representing wisdom and the unknowable. In this way, they work to serve the wider world that Tolkien built, and to cement the themes he was going for. In other words, the focus of the book was never the characters alone, but rather the entire world that Tolkien had created. The films, on the other hand, are much more focused on the characters rather than the wider tapestry of Middle-earth. Each has doubts, fears, and insecurities, and like actual humans, they're all fallible. In the films, Aragorn begins in a state of reluctance. He doubts himself and his capability to lead, and doesn't always speak up like a traditional hero. And heir to the throne of Gondor. How about that? I would 
Jesus. Frodo begins in much the same way. His strength of will and courage are comparatively diluted. He's less principal, rendering him more susceptible to the power of the ring throughout his quest. Throughout the trilogy, Aragorn is repeatedly thrust into positions of leadership that challenges fears and insecurities, like leading the Fellowship after Gandalf apparently croaks. When Elrond shows up with the symbolic blade of the Kings of Men, i.e. Aragorn's birthright, he wields the newly forged blade, symbolically resolving his self-doubt and embracing his destiny. Here, he earns the kingship, rather than just collecting it like in the book. Similarly, in being more deeply affected and influenced by the ring, Frodo has to overcome physical, psychological, and spiritual challenges in order to make it to Mount Doom, even if he does kind of murder our favorite CGI gremlin to do it. He takes extreme actions along the way, like chumming it up with Gollum and casting old faithful Sam away, you can't help me anymore, and has to resolve those mistakes in order to succeed. This here is screenwriting 101. Each central character is challenged spiritually or psychologically, leading to a drastic internal change. This classic character arc is fundamental to mainstream film, and is a surefire way to create dramatic tension in a movie. The characters in the book, however, function the exact same way the characters do in myth. That's not to say that they're not changed by the quest of the ring, they are. However, these changes are more reactive, rather than resulting from inner conflict. Take Aragorn. From the moment we first meet him, dude's pretty set on fulfilling his legacy and taking up the kingship of men. He makes no secret of his lineage and his intention to assume the throne. By the end of the book, Aragorn is king, and he hasn't had to overcome any real challenge or obstacle to get there. In short, his character arc in the book is, wants the kingship, does a quest, gets the kingship. There's progression in the arc, sure, but no tension. There's the same lack of tension with Frodo, arguably the most central character to the plot. His arc, from first talking with Gandalf about the ring in Bag End, to finally making it to Mount Doom is essentially, agrees to destroy the ring, does a quest, destroys the ring. His conviction never wavers and his inherent nature is never challenged. Even the corruptive power of the One Ring only challenges him physically rather than psychologically. To be fair, Tolkien does state that Frodo struggles to find peace once the ring is destroyed and has to leave for Elf Heaven as a result. But the key word there is states. Tolkien doesn't show us the process, he tells us at the end. In allowing the characters to be more fallible, the film makes the characters much more relatable than in the books. Sure, not many of us have had to wrestle with becoming a legendary king, but we've all dealt with self-doubt. It's rare for any of us to walk across a continent to destroy a magic ring, but we've all struggled to manage our feelings. So all in all, making the characters less archetypical is a win, right? Difference number three, religion. While it's not quite as clear cut, the film's fallible characters change the story in one other, deeper way. And as a result, the book and film each seem to have very different approaches to religion, specifically the Catholic faith that Tolkien stand. The book has tons of allusions to Christianity in general, but one of the strongest cases is to do with the trio of Gandalf, Frodo, and Aragorn, and something called threefold messianic symbolism. Threefold messianic symbolism, in a very basic sense, represents the three aspects or offices of Christ, aspects that many figures evoke throughout the Old and New Testaments. In the book, Frodo, Aragorn, and Gandalf represent the offices of the priest, king, and prophet, respectively. All three go through some kind of death and rebirth, like Jesus, and naturally all three are saviors of Middle-earth. Each of these offices are an aspect of Jesus as displayed in the Bible. This is where Tolkien's use of static archetypes in the book serves him well. If archetypes are the purest distillation of an idea or thing, then it's easy to see how they can effectively represent aspects of a divine being like Jesus Christ. Archetypes, in this sense, exist to convey a message or idea, not necessarily to grow. The serpent in the story of Genesis doesn't need an arc, he needs to symbolize temptation. The films, however, seem to accidentally stumble into a critique of Tolkien symbolism. Frodo, the priest figure, turns away his closest friend fueled by malice and spite. Gandalf, the prophet figure, is more intellectually uncertain, less wise than he is in the book. Aragorn, the king figure, straight up doesn't want to be king at first. The very same flaws and character that made them more compelling on film undermine the three aspects of Jesus Christ. In doing so, the film sort of unwittingly proposed a more secular Middle Earth, one removed from the religious influences that were a big part of Tolkien's life. I mean, you could argue that, at its most severe, the films actively refute the notion of a divine Jesus Christ, which is such a spicy hot take that Dan Brown should write another book about it. Dan, if you want to collab, just slide into the comments. Now, I'm not sure we entirely want to commit to that, 
but if you need a Twitter hill to die on, be our guest. All in all, credit absolutely goes to Peter Jackson and everyone involved for managing to bring the Lord of the Rings to film in any form. But what do you guys think? Were the changes he made totally reasonable? Or should the films be cast into a volcano for their crimes? Would you rather listen to Treebeard do the alphabet rap than read through the book? Oh, and one last thing. You shall not pass! There wasn't any place for it earlier. Trust me, we tried. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Covet that subscribe button like your Gollum at a jewelry fair, and don't forget to ring that bell. Get it? And as always, thanks for watching. Later.